Hi there, thanks very much. Um, I believe that talent is universal, however, I believe also the opportunity isn't. And my reason for saying that is, I suppose, from my own personal experience. I was really lucky, I grew up in a house that was filled with love, eh, and a lot of safety and a lot of caring. However, there wasn't a lot of money. Uh, my dad was a lorry driver, he worked really long hours. My mum worked in a factory, she worked really long hours. I looked around, I suppose, when I, when I look back now and I look at the, the people that were around me in terms of my mum and dad's family and friends, they were all the same sort of people, just really pleased to be keeping a job, really pleased to have food on the table, really pleased just about making, paying the bills. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, life's moved on from that, but I've spent 30 years of my career working with particularly uh, challenged communities, but I don't like to call it that. I think it's communities of opportunity, because I think if we, as society, actually looked at the people that are really getting left behind and actually invested and made lots of changes, these communities become much more empowered. They actually contribute to our economy, and actually, in terms of the well-being of society, um, we make a positive, positive change. So while I was researching for this, I came across this cartoon strip, and apologies if you can't quite see it at the back, but it's done by a guy called Toby Morris, and Toby really basically introduces two young people. So we've got Richard here, and then we've got Paula. So basically, you know, they're doing okay. Um, Richard probably comes from the kind of family that I've got now, Paula probably was me when I was younger. So, oh sorry, the trigger finger there, sorry about that. Richard's lucky, as you can see, he's got lots of toys, he's got, you know, he's living in a house that's got loads of books, there's probably a great central heating system, there's probably masses of toy, and what masses of clothes in his wardrobe. Paula is living in a house with bare floorboards, as one of our speakers earlier talked about, very, very you know, evocative in the way that she described her, her own childhood. A similar sort of situation. Um, you know, she's got she's got people that are there for her, but there's not a lot of cash around and there's certainly not a lot of cash to spend on you know, the niceties of, of life, or as I would see it, the necessities, which is nourishment and books and toys and clothes and, and warmth. So basically, uh, as Richard's going on through his life, you know, his parents are really interested in him. They're, they're checking he's doing, they're doing his home, that he's getting his homework done, and you know, he's probably getting lots of really good clubs, getting taken to gymnastics or football. Or if this starts to feel familiar, you'll recognise that that's that's as parents the kind of things you want for your child. The reality is, a lot of the communities, a mile away from where we are can't give that to their children. And I think it's really important to remember that as, as we go along. So Carla's parents, you know, yeah, they really care about it as well, but you know what, they're doing two jobs each. Um, my dad used to leave the house on a Sunday night and he came back on a Thursday having driven up to Aberdeen, Dundee, down to London, Liverpool, Manchester. My mum used to leave the house at seven in the morning and got back at six at night, utterly exhausted and drained from a really, really heavy day in the factory. They loved us, but I would have just liked more of them when I was growing up. Um, but you know, they were there and they did the best they could. So Richard continues to do really well. He's got a great school. He's going to school and, and the teachers really love what they're doing. They're probably quite well resourced. They can probably take the kids out in quite a lot of interesting um, day trips. They can probably get the children to really concentrate because the parents are very engaged. They're being, um, they're being selected for that, those particular types of schools because they get good academic results. For Paula, maybe less so. She's maybe in an area where, touched on again earlier, maybe half the kids are at school and they're hungry. Now if you think about when you're hungry at work, how do you feel? Your concentration dips. You actually feel really tired. You might feel a bit withdrawn. You might actually get into arguments with people in meetings because you're hungry. Right? So imagine if you've got 27 people in a class and half of the kids are like that. They're not really going to get the chance to learn an awful lot if that's the kind of environment that, that's surrounding you on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, if you, if you 
you're in a position where you're getting a B plus and it's not good enough, you get a tutor, but if you're in a position where you're getting a B, that's an amazing achievement if you've come from a, a school background like that. So, as I say, that Richard goes off to university, mum and dad are paying for him, put my hand up, got a son at university just now, mum and dad are paying his rent, he still works, he's got, he's got his own part-time job, but I'm paying his rent and his dad's paying his rent. Paula, she's juggling, going to the Polytechnic, that was me, I had, I had the grades to go to uni, couldn't afford to go, I had an older brother and an older sister who had already left school at the first point they could to go out and get jobs to bring money into the house. I was really lucky, I, I still feel guilty 40 years later that I was the one that got, to, that got the education, the, the tertiary education that my, my sister and my brother didn't. Um, but it didn't mean that I didn't work. I had a cleaning job two days a week in the morning before I went to college and I, I actually worked in a bar a couple of nights a week and I also sang in a band so I had a work ethic but it really did impact probably quite negatively on my experience of studying so I think that's another thing to think about. Paula's really had a bad time of it, she's had, she's had caring responsibilities as well and a lot of the young people that, that we work with particularly in, in the, the not-for-profit sector, they are in that position. When you grow up in poverty, it comes with lots of additional challenges, as the, the, the film we saw of the TED, the TEDx, the, the TED, the Med, TED Med, wasn't it, uh, presentation, it impacts on your health, and before you know it, you can be caring for two sick parents, um, and they might only be in their late 40s, early 50s. My dad was the eldest of 15 children. His dad died at the age of 42 very very difficult life and you know just it just perpetuates the, the, the challenge you have going through our lives then we've got the whole you know this just it just keeps building up and building up you don't have the social capital so I missed, I missed the key point there which was his Richard wants a bit of work experience dad's got a really great network now when I was 20 I had no idea what a network was um, you know, I didn't realise that people had family and friends that would help you out to get work. I just thought that, you know, that was an incredible opportunity that, that I never even realised. And it really only hit home to me when I found a job selling shoes in a department store. And the people I was at college with started doing things like working in the Daily Record or STB or PR, PR companies or really interesting roles. And when I dug a little bit deeper how they got them, well, my dad knew somebody, or my mum worked with somebody, or my dad plays golf with. I didn't have that, and a lot of the young people that we work with in the, th the third sector don't have that either. So right away from the very get-go, your social capital's in the red. You don't have people that can give you that necessary hand up, not a hand out. That's not what this is about. This is about giving people a hand up to get them moving on to a more positive place. And then if it just becomes insidious, trying to, get, um, trying to get a loan to get something, trying to get a mortgage, it becomes more and more difficult as you keep trying to move to the, ne the next level of your life. If you do not have that backbone of networks and support and encouragement behind you. And then you've got the whole, you know, getting a good job and somebody supporting you because they know the family you come from. And it becomes another layer of challenge that poor Paula has to try and fight her way through. And then we've got Richard being Mr. Successful, he's probably won an award or he's been promoted and it's just fantastic. And we've got Paula here who's trying to earn a bit of extra cash and she's, <coughs> she's the waitress for the event. Now what I would hope is that my son, who has had the advantage of my network and has had lots of work experience throughout his life and has worked really hard for it, does not ever use those words that Richard uses, that nobody's ever handed him anything on a plate. Because I would be incredibly ashamed of him um, if that was the case. The other thing I just wanted to touch on is, I suppose the, the notion of a self-made man or a self-made woman, I don't think that ever exists. I think we are all, um, a result of every kind word we've ever been given, of every bit of encouragement we've ever been some, someone's given us, even the negative that we get, that's the makes the character of who we are and what we do with life. 
Um, personally, I think that I've also got a 15 year old daughter and I get fed up when I go to, to, to parents nights and all anybody, anyone ever wants to talk about is her academic achievements. I know what they are, I know the percentages that she gets in her, in her, her exams. What I want to know is, is she kind? Is she thoughtful? Does she support people? Does she play? Does she make friends? Is she socialised? Actually, I think these are the things that you take with you and education is important, but actually let's start valuing other things that aren't just about your educational results um, and, and, and help people to move on and to appreciate each other. I love um, a quote that went, that's attributed to, to Winston Churchill, which is, you know, you make a life by what you get, but you make, you make, sorry, you make a living by what you get, but you make a life by what you give. Um, and then the roles that I've always had, I've always been um, incredibly supported and encouraged by the people who give in terms of their time, in terms of their expertise, um, and just even seeing um, that some of the slides up earlier that Robert put up about the number of people giving volunteering hours to the number of charities we have in Scotland, that made my heart swell because it's very easy to keep thinking in your own little bubble that you are, you know, you're really busy, you've got your own family, you know, you've got your own focuses and your own challenges, but the number of people that step out of that and give two, three, four, five hours a week to help other people I think is an incredibly inspiring thing to do. And also I think the impact of that can go on and on and on for years. Just on Friday I got a text message from a, a young woman that I helped a couple of years ago with a bit of advice. She was in a very difficult place. And I'll be perfectly frank with you, I completely forgot that I had done it. And she sent me a text on Friday and I was thinking, who is this girl? Um, she asked if I would phone her, phoned her and then it clicked that when she started to tell me what, what the situation was. She was phoning me to tell me that it'd taken two years to get the bit of advice I'd given her into action, but it actually worked for her and she was in a much, much better place, both mentally and financially. And no matter what happens to me for the rest of, the, the rest of this month, I think, when things get tough, I'll think about that because you can never, as a, as a volunteer, eh, forget that these things can have impacts for you know, it's, it's almost like throwing a, a pebble on the river and, or a pebble on the water of a pond and it, it just watch, watching the ripple effect. Um, I, I think I'd just like to kind of finish off by just asking all of you to think about mm -hmm. this, which is to be kind, just to be kind to people. If you find yourself about to say something negative or not particularly harmonious in the, the, the life that you have, whether that be at work or be at home, try and keep those words in just try and think about it in a, a, a much more kind way. My sister-in-law is a Samaritan and she said that um, the number of older people that phone and they just want to speak because they are so incredibly lonely um, and it really as a family we made the decision that if we were ever in a queue to buy anything whether it's in a supermarket or a department store that we would stop and have a look and if it was an older person in front or behind or no matter actually, just look at the people in front or behind and just speak to them. And as British people, we all like uh, talking about the weather, so you can always just say it's a cold day today or whatever. <laughs> you might be the only person in that person's life that's actually noticed them to have a conversation with them that day. So you, ha you often have no idea of the impact of that kind word. So I would just like to finish by saying be kind, be thoughtful, and be particularly aware of young people around you and do what you can to help them to build on maybe the lack of social capital that they live with. Thank you very much.